The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. In those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the sun, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Yesterday, we got our kids out of the house for a walk. As we passed by our kids' favorite climbing tree, which happens to be a crab apple tree on the boulevard just in front of our neighbor's house, I noticed the buds on the branches. There they were tightly compressed, tiny leaves and flowers packed in and protected, waiting for spring. Already there, exposed in late November, shielded against the cold by a thin, hard membrane. Until about last year, I'd never noticed this. I always thought buds formed in the spring. That makes sense, right? New growth happens in spring, or so I'd been told. But no, it doesn't. New, new growth is revealed in spring. Even as the plants around us appear to be dormant, they are working. And this time of preparation is important. Even as this year's leaves are dying and falling away, the new is already there, taking its place. Even before we descend into snow and slush and day after day of Michigan gray, the promise of spring is already contained in these buds. Growth doesn't just happen. The tree meticulously prepares for it, devoting energy to what is to come, even as what is falls away. It prepares as well to wait, somehow knowing that the winter will be long and that it must be ready to withstand it. Through it all, the tree will ultimately grow again, showing forth with beautiful flowers and deep green leaves that change to brilliant deep red in their autumn glory. But for now, it waits, its bare silhouette dotted by these little buds of promise. Perhaps this Advent, more than any other, we understand what it is to live in the not yet. Normally, pastors focus their Advent sermons around reminding people that even if your tree is up and the mall is covered in lights, we are still waiting for Christmas. But this year, we all get how much we're waiting. There is no need for a reminder. We are waiting to get better. We're waiting for loved ones to recuperate, waiting for postponed medical procedures, waiting to go back to school, waiting to worship together and sing together waiting to not have to remember that mask on the way out of the door, waiting to come out of our houses and to see loved ones in person and give them hugs. This long winter, 
part of a Lent that just evolved into Advent without much relief has been such a long time to be like that crab apple with its branches stark against the sky. We are waiting. But unlike the trees, this is not part of our rhythm. We were never meant to spend so much time on our own, apart from friends and loved ones. This season of preparation, though, is an opportunity for change. Before the pandemic, there were plenty of parts of our lives and society that could have been different, but we weren't ready to rock the boat because things were working kind of sort of well enough. But in the midst of so much loss, though, comes a time of opportunity. Pope Francis wrote an op-ed in the New York Times on Thanksgiving Day, and I recommend it to you. Here's a quote. This is a moment to dream, dream big, to rethink our priorities, what we value, what we want, what we seek, and to commit to act in our daily life and what we have dreamed of. God asks us to dare to create something new. We cannot return to the false securities of the political and economic systems we had before the crisis. We need economies that give to all access to the fruits of creation, to the basic needs of life, to land, lodging, and labor. We need a politics that can integrate and dialogue with the poor, the excluded, and the vulnerable that gives people a say in the decisions that affect their lives. We need to slow down, take stock, and design better ways of living together on this earth. Do we dare? Do we dare to participate in the creation of something new, something different, a world more aligned with the vision of God's kingdom? Do we dare to demand that schools no longer be the backstop for every problem children face? That people no longer go bankrupt because of healthcare bills? That our LGBTQ plus siblings no longer have to hide who they are? That our black and brown siblings no longer have to fear for their lives if they encounter law enforcement? Justice is love out loud and love is a commitment, a deep commitment, an abiding commitment to the image of God that is inherent in every single one of us. God calls us to a life of intentional, sacrificial love, a love that sees the change that is necessary and overcomes the fear inherent in making that change. Our gospel this week is about big change, a change that tears the heavens open and gives us a vision of a world we can only begin to imagine. This Advent, more than any other we have experienced, we are called into a posture of hope, a hope that is necessarily daring and brave because in order to hope, we have to admit that change is necessary. We aren't going to be chasing down tchotchkes at the mall this year. Instead, we've got time to contemplate and prepare as we wait. So this year, what do you dare to hope for? What is God calling you to prepare for? Amen.